Oi, oi, it's your boy, the patchy mix of disastrous picks. Jack Slack is the Jack Slack podcast, and we're coming at you on Monday, the 24th of April. Huge weekend of fights, not in the UFC. If you didn't notice me all week banging on about the fact that there were a lot of good fights on that weren't the UFC, um, there were. There was tons. There was uh, two Bellator events, one one FC event, or one championship event. Um, there was a Rise kickboxing card. There was boxing between Ryan Garcia and Javonta Davis. It was a great one. If you like watching people get hit, it was a really good weekend. There was also uh, a huge gi jiu-jitsu tournament that I haven't watched yet, but I'll talk about that on the boycast probably, if I can bring myself to watch any gi. Well, we're going to be talking about all that today because it was really good. There was so much good stuff on, um, and if you haven't watched any of these, let me tell you how good they are. Um, and but before that, you know, obviously, what keeps the lights on here at uh, Chateau Slack is talking about the UFC. Um, it was a pretty bad card. It turned out pretty mid. And it had a frustrating heavyweight headliner. You know, what more could you want? So in case you're one of those people who was, you know, watched Sergei Pavlovich swing from his thighs against Curtis Blades, taking punches on the chin the entire time um, and getting a stoppage, and then went, damn, I want to hear what Jack Slack has to say about Sergei Pavlovich's elite striking technique. Um, let's start with that. <laughs> yep, same shit as always. Comes out, throws punches from his, you know, with his arms swinging down by his sides. Gets clattered with a load of punches coming back. Fair play to him. Great chin. And there were people talking, you know, everyone this week was talking about his hand speed. Because I think they need a way to differentiate him from... Francis, or make him some, something that he's better at than, say, like Francis Ngannou. Um, it, it's all about Sergei Pavlovich's hand, fit, hand speed. Um, I'd have focused on his ridiculous reach, but they're not that fast when you watch him. It's just that there are there is always four punches coming after. You know, he throws the jab, gets his head jacked back, and there's three other punches. He's swinging with his head back, eyes staring up at the ring lights. But this was another uh, Blades-esque performance. Curtis Blades taking over the Alistair Overeem role of the guy being good at everything, but also managing to, to blow it quite a lot. Yeah, no good faith efforts at a takedown until he was hit. Uh, lots of trying to cover and, and throw back, and he did. He landed good punches. But it's like, you're planning on knocking this guy out who you've watched get chinned clean numerous times on the counter. Um, it's kind of like I always said about like the Diaz's or whoever, yeah, they'll get knocked out at some point. At some point, the chin's going to fail, but don't plan on being the first guy to do it. You know, invest in body work, try and take them down, kick their legs. I mean, Pavlovich is there for the low kicks. Stands real long, was pretty crouched in this one because he was worried about the takedown attempt. And, um, you know, if, if you kick him as Curtis Blades, he's not going to catch it and run you down, you know, run you to the mat and try and hold you there. So some weird decision making by Curtis Blades. In terms of Pavlovich's striking, you know, he caught him with the jab because Curtis Blades does that thing where he goes, oh, oh, I don't want to engage, I don't want to engage. Okay, bite down on the mouthpiece, jab, and he, like, dives in. And that's where um, Nganu cracked him in the second fight, too, across the top of the jab, exactly the same way that um, Pavlovich hurt him with one of the punches here. But then you saw some, you know, basic striking um, ability being shown by Pavlovich. He threw a nice, he threw a, a long, he threw a long right uppercut to, uh, because Blades was ducking down behind his forearm and, and coming back with the right straight. So he threw a long right uppercut to stand him up, and then he threw the, the right hand across the top the next time. You know, standard playoff between the, the overhand and the uppercut, or the, you know, looping straight and the uppercut. Did we learn any more about Pavlovich? No! <laughs> it's just, just continues spazzing out in the first minute. Is anyone excited about him versus John Jones? Well, hold on. It's actually him versus the winner of John Jones versus the ghost of Stipe Miocic. Has it has a division ever become so uninteresting so quickly as when John Jones came up and said, "Oh, actually, these guys are awful." But I put up a clip of him of Pavlovich lunging in with a jab and his right hand down by his hips, getting clattered with the counter right hand, and continuing to swing with his hands down by his sides. And uh, and I just put bra, and a load of people were tweeting like retweeting it, going, "Oh my God, the chin! He's going to walk through Jones's punches." And, when has Jones ever punched someone? Like that's not even that's not even what he does. Um, just bizarre. It would be the most heavyweight thing ever for him to win the belt of John Jones by spazzing out in the first minute. But 
I'm not going to get my hopes up. And to be honest, I'm not getting my hopes up on John not retiring after the Stipe fight. We might end up with Pavlovich versus Garn for the vacant heavyweight title or some shit. But we'll come back to the UFC later to talk about all the crap that was on the undercard. Um, you know, there were a couple of good knockouts in there and there was a headbutt. You know, so my favourite thing in combat sports. But let's talk about some good shit that went down this weekend. I was very hype about Nongo versus John Haggerty. Um, Haggerty going up to bantamweight f- from flyweight, uh, put on a bit of weight. In our preview, we were talking about how Haggerty is, what's made him stand out versus other Westerners who take up Muay Thai is that most Westerners taking up Muay Thai, almost Farang, as they call them over there, um, they tend to gravitate towards big punching and combination punching into low kicks and so on. And they'll do the Muay Thai stuff when they're in against someone who's like another Farang who's worse than Muay Thai. You know, they're not big clinch specialists. They're not hugely into the teep or the switch kick. You know, two of the big marks of uh, traditional Muay Thai. Switch kicking straight off the bat and using the teep and, and using the teep to set up gliding steps in where you lift your leg and you just glide in behind it by faking the teep and not actually throwing it. And playing those things off each other. And what John Haggerty has been very good at in his very short 25 fight career um, is use, playing the lead leg teep off with the switch kick and then using both of them to gli- to hide gliding in to attack with one twos and elbows. And like I said on the podcast, if Same and Rod Tang are struggling with your teep, and Rod Tang said you know, in the, in the interviews before the second fight, he was like, having a lot of trouble with his teep. Um, if they're struggling with your teep and they've had between them over five, wait, they might have had over 600 fights, actually. I think both of them are about, Rod Tang's going to be 300 and I think Sammy's coming up on like 350. So if they're saying that you've got a pretty good teep, you've got a pretty good teep. Um, and that's just something that doesn't exist largely in uh, Western Muay Thai. And then we talked about how Ramazanov, the last guy that Norway fought, did a really good job um, switching to southpaw, fake, and either throwing a big left leg, so rear leg, push kick, slash teep, whatever you want to call it, um, and then mix that with switching to southpaw, picking up his rear leg, and stepping in with one twos. Or maybe he was orthodox, maybe he was switching to orthodox. But whatever he did, he stepped into the opposite stance by picking up his knee as if to teep, and then just putting it down and punching. And he gave Nongo a lot of trouble. And Nongo finally caught up with him and hit him with some body shots and stopped the fight. And it was quite interesting because those things that Ramazanov gave Nongo trouble with John Haggerty is very good at and does regularly. So that was interesting there. But the thing that Nongo did to get back in the fight and finish Ramazanov very quickly is the thing that John Haggerty struggles with. John Haggerty struggles if you make it a firefight and if you start hitting his body, he's very long and skinny for the weight class. You know, ha- um, Rod Tang took him apart with bodywork very quickly. So reminder, you can watch this free on YouTube. Uh, you can watch the whole event if you so feel like doing, but just watch Haggerty versus Nongo. Um, yeah, Haggerty came out and immediately started giving him trouble with the mix-ups, with the teep and the uh, switch kick, and then gliding in with one-twos off that. I really love the way that he uses his uh, switch step to throw the left round kick. Um, sometimes he switches to feet level, sometimes he switches to a full southpaw. So against Nongo here, he switched to, he, he did a switch step all, all the way into southpaw uh, so that his left leg was behind him, and then he picked his leg up as if to throw a big, powerful front kick which he often does, switches to southpaw and then punts you with a, uh, a left leg push kick with way more power than it did originally have. Um, and then he stepped through and hit him with one too. It was really nice. He was throwing the teep to the lead leg, which is something that we talked about Nongo doing very well against Liam Harrison when we were discussing the calf kick in uh, high-level striking sports. Because Liam Harrison, uh, Nongo took him out basically with calf kicks while Liam Harrison was trying to check. Uh, and he did it by applying this lead leg push kick to the knee so that when Harrison picked his leg up to check, it was pointing more towards Nongo and then kicking as hard as he could with round kicks around the side. Uh, It's that slight change in angle of the knee when you pick it up. If you're dealing with kicks coming from the front to to extend your leg or hyperextend your leg, you put your knee towards that. Uh, If you're dealing with round kicks coming in to attack the leg from the side, you point your shin and knee out towards the, you know, where the kick's coming from. And uh, if you can get the guy doing the wrong thing by a few inches you can start sneaking kicks around the side when he's picking his leg up to to, uh, to check kicks from the front and that's what Nongo did to um, Harrison and Haggerty was trying to wrong foot him with it here very funny because a lot of people pretend that like 
when the oblique kick and the low line side kick were taking off in MMA, people were pretending that no one kicks to hyperextend the leg in Muay Thai. And they do. It's just more annoying because everyone's in position to pick their leg up all the time. It's just making the guy pick his leg up a certain way. Um, and then everyone was also pretending that calf kicks don't work in Muay Thai and guys like Nongo have just picked it up and run with it. Yuki Yoza, the current best kickboxer in the world at his weight, uh, has been stopping guys with calf kicks. So again, if you're a Patreon boy, go read the article about that because it was it was called uh, Some Thoughts on Calf Kicking and Arm Triangles. It was just about um, not the meta, but how how you apply these things against or how elite guys apply these things against elite guys rather than just MMA where you walk out and you try and calf kick the guy as hard as you can and if he checks it, you go, well, I'm out of ideas. Sorry guys, got a seriously sore throat coming through. Um, drinking lots of hot tea, but bear with me. But anyway, Haggerty stepped in with a one-two to the body and then immediately stepped in with a one-two to the head, to, with a one-two to the head. and it looked like he'd head-butted him, but then they showed the replay and he hadn't. It was just a real short right hand, just changing levels as if to hit the body again, hit him in the head, uh, dropped him, and then Olivia Cost made Haggerty knock him down twice more. Uh, and it, you know, On the first one, Haggerty's like, look at him, he's, he's completely out of it. Uh, and Cost made him hit him two more times and, and drop him on his face. Huge win for uh, John Haggerty. And people have been asking me like, now, is he is he like all time great British Nakmoy or whatever? Um, I think there is. You know, we do have to consider that four rounds Muay Thai is different to traditional Muay Thai. And I was reading today; it, it broke in January, but I somehow missed it. The um, some kind of governing body of Muay Thai in Thailand is uh, trying to sue one for their different Muay Thai rules for advertising four rounds Muay Thai as Muay Thai. Um, and of course, it's just a shakedown. Like this is, and and there's weirdos on the internet being like they're trying to preserve their con- their tradition, blah blah blah. No one's preserving the tradition because no one else wants to to uh, promote fights at Lumpini anymore. That's that's why one are there. Uh, the actual Muay Thai promoters were like, "Fuck it, we don't make any money," and the government's also cracking down on gambling, so we're making even less money. Uh, so all this like, oh, tradition and honor. No, it's bollocks. <laughs> one of the only people willing to put their money into this at the moment. But people are basically siding with, like, it's the equivalent of the WBA saying, uh, if, if bare-knuckle boxing got massive, the WBA were like, uh, you're advertising boxing, and actually it's not under the Queensbury rules, and uh, we own boxing, the, the term. So uh, pay us money, or we'll take you to court. <laughs> That's what you're doing. You're cheering on the WBA, basically, of Thailand. But yes, it is different in four-ounce gloves. We've been talking about this recently, but if you watch the fight, uh, well, if you watch any of these fights, guys are getting caught with short little left hands, little left hooks and little lead right hooks from southpaws um, that wouldn't do much in traditional Muay Thai. Um, there's, you know, the jury's out on whether you can hit harder with a big glove or a small glove. When they do those sports science tests on that awful program and they get bass rooting in to break a spleen or whatever, um, you know, it's, it's loading up a big swing with a four-ounce glove and it's loading up a big swing with an eight-ounce glove and the weight of the eight-ounce glove on your hand makes the swing harder. Um, but with the four ounce gloves, obviously more things sneak through, and that's not just because you can cover up with four, with eight ounce gloves and, and ten ounce gloves more effectively. Um, that's because a lot of Muay Thai is also checking the other guy's hands. If you've got two guys who want to uh, hand fight with both hands and try and turn over elbows or, or land knees or just enter clinches, yeah, the, the elbows and knees are high stakes techniques. They can knock someone out, but you've also got guys shutting down. A lot of the fastest blows that happen in a in a boxing or kickboxing match, you only need to look at uh, Philippe Lobo. His his knockout over Samer Petch on the same card. Uh, you know he's losing in round three, and then he just clips him with a good left hook on the chin as uh, Samer Petch is out of position or confidently marching forward, and uh, it it changes the whole complexion of the fight. So four ounce Muay Thai is a different sport just because of the gloves, but also they within one there is a, a de-emphasis of the clinch. They don't like it as much. There is no uh, fucking around with slow opening rounds for the gamblers or whatever. There's no flute, which I fucking love. Um, but, you know, it is, it's different. Um, with that being said, Jonathan Haggerty, in 25 fights, has beaten some names that other top British guys just um, were never able to. And certainly Nongo, you know, there was this sort of debate about him getting older, but uh, he does seem to be at the height of his powers. But I've, I've been saying for ages, I think everyone should be watching Haggerty because... With a couple of things, he's going even in proper Muay Thai with proper Muay Thai legends, not just by trying to overwhelm them with aggression and combinations. 
That being said, of course, Stadium Muay Thai. Was this in a stadium? Hold on. No, this was in Singapore. Um, but Stadium Muay Thai, in the traditional sense, different game, different sport, different judging. Obviously, doesn't matter if you knock the dude out, but who knows? With one taking over at Lumpini and no one else wanted to do it, you know, Stadium Muay Thai, this might be the new Muay Thai uh, in, in the future. Um, certainly, I fucking love four-ounce Muay Thai, and so does everyone else who watches it. But I know, as I've said on previous episodes, there are coaches now speaking out against it. There, uh, Sylvie Douglas von Itu had a uh, golden era legend talking about how he had two fighters appear on um, one card and get very badly concussed taking shots from four-ounce gloves, um, where, you know... Yes, young ties are taking like hundreds of fights, but you can't do that if you're getting chinned every single time. You would be a dribbling mess. One of the things about traditional Muay Thai is that a lot of the time, dudes don't, don't get hurt that badly. Anyway, you should watch that. What else was on the um, one card? Halil Amir won against Marisa Bibi. That was okay. Um, Bokang Masignane in a ring did some lay and pray to prove the nerds wrong about the ring. Um, Felipe Lobo, I said, you know, did uh, two and a bit rounds. He was getting a real hard time from Simapetch. And then he uh, just turned it around with a knockout in the third. Really incredible upset. Not quite as, as impressive as Haggerty's because Haggerty, Nongo didn't get anything going. I mean, it, it happened so quickly. I actually was 240 of the first round, so the first round was almost over. But it, it happened so quickly in the grand scheme of things that I would have loved to see more of it. But Lobo was in there for most of the fight, having a really hard time, and then just caught him. So yes, Muay Thai nerds in uproar. Um, people who enjoy four ounce Muay Thai having a great time, as always. I feel like all my positive thoughts on this podcast are about four ounce Muay Thai. It's just a relentlessly positive sport. It's a it's a force for good in combat sports, and one are paying these guys more than they ever would have made. Winning Lumpini Stadium titles and whatnot. Oh, your fighter of the year? Does that buy a bag of groceries? As Marvin Hagler would say. So let's talk Bellator, because Bellator... I mean, they basically won by default this weekend, but they did have some good fights on. Um, won by default in the MMA category. Because this is an MMA podcast, technically. And uh, one, their MMA is just sort of there to prop up the four-ounce Muay Thai stuff. Bellator, we had the conclusion of the uh, bantamweight tournament, but the bantamweight tournament is stupid. Because <laughs> I mean, it's good. It was a really good tournament, but it's also stupid because Sergio Pettis had to drop out, so they put an interim title in the tournament. So Rufian Stott won and defended an interim title, which is really stupid. Anytime you're defending an interim title, you should just be the champion. Um, and then this fight was to defend it a second time. So the interim title has been fought for three times in the uh, in the interim. Um, meanwhile, so they've got to keep it on Sergio Pettis because Pitbull Frere, the good one, Patricio Pitbull, wants to come down and try and win a third belt. And people are like, yeah, you do it. But really, like, that's just, can I diet enough to be a weight bully? <laughs> that's, that's not nearly as cool as going up a weight class and fighting at a disadvantage, which he's done. But uh, it's really weird people getting behind him on this one. Uh, so they're desperately trying to keep Sergio in there because Sergio will probably lose if Patricio can make weight without dying. But anyway, what it means is that Patchy Mix is the best bantamweight in Bellator, but he has to wait. He's Robert Whittaker to um, Sergio Pettis' Michael Bisping, or GSP. But yes, Patchy Mix versus Ruffian Stotts. Uh, Mix had beaten Koji Horiguchi. And then Magomed Magomedov by a really impressive guillotine choke that he almost got about three times in the course of that fight. Um, Rufian Stotts had beaten Juan Archuleta, the former champion, by a head kick. And then Danny, 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 Danny Sabatello um, it, by a split decision in, in his last fight. So this was the final. And I've got to be honest, it was the most surprising outcome for most of us because Patchy Mix is striking. Not great. Everyone knows Patchy Mix is a force on the ground. Um, I was watching the B team. Uh, Craig Jones's team in Austin, Texas. They've got a great YouTube channel, and uh, I think it's Damian Anderson was uh, was there. He's getting ready for some MMA fights, and he's a member of the B team. He grapples to a, a pretty high level, and he actually just had a great match against Cole Abate, uh, which I was going to write something about because it was really interesting technically. Um, but he was saying that he'd just been down training with uh, 
I can't remember who it was, but then he said, and they got this guy down there, Patchy Mix, who's about to fight for a million dollars in the tournament final, and his grappling is shit hot. So if you've got someone like that saying you're grappling shit hot, you're grappling shit hot. But his striking was never a strong suit. Um, so he comes out in this one, and they're both southpaw, so he throws jab, long left hook, so a, le- a left swing around the side. Think Conor McGregor going around Dustin Poirier's guard. He throws that about three times, and then he steps in with a knee, and he catches Rafian Stotts, who's shorter and also a bit bent over, right on the chin. Knocks him out. That's the end of your fight. <laughs> that's, that's, that's as much as you saw between them. But, um, man, it was a good read. Real good read. And something that he should be doing more, because he's not... I don't. It is a cliche to be like, he's not scared to be on his back. But I don't think he's scared to be on his back. Um, and he's, he's a good enough grappler that he can probably wrestle up. And he's also so much taller than these guys. You know, we, even Brandon Royval, who is a pretty scrambly grappler, has to sort of worry about being taken down off those knees. Patrick Mix could just step up and throw him at will. I mean, there's other ways to get countered, but the main one that we worry about in MMA is getting bundled over. So going to have a lot of fun when he fights, presumably, Pitbull, when they get that wrapped up. Um, hard ask, because Pitbull has great takedown defense, and he's real strong in the clinch. You know, it's really weird watching his featherweight fights, because these guys are towering over him, and he's just got an underhook and an overhook, and he's holding them up, throwing them around. But yeah, I mean, if I were fighting, uh, if I were Patchy Mix fighting Pitbull, what I'd be wanting to do is do what AJ McKee did, abuse kicks, especially high kicks, and then knees from Patchy Mix, because those are the weapons that are going to be, well, you can't really safely slip them. You can duck under a a head kick, you can duck, uh, you know, you can slip inside a, a knee, but it's real dangerous to do. Wouldn't advise people start trying to slip knees like Mike Tyson. So what they can do is stand people up and then you can land your you know, shitty left straight on them much easier. Also keeps their hands at home, which prevents people from doing those bursting entries and, and jumping into the left hook and so on. But that's another fight for another day. I'm just saying patchy mixes look great in this tournament. Um, you know, stuck to, to Koji Horiguchi and just looked like a limpet. Uh, strangled Magomed Magomedov in a very impressive way which I think everyone should watch. If you want to see like when that guillotine choke is a threat, when sitting down on the guillotine is a threat, uh, Patchy Mix. I keep saying it, but he always sits down with it and turns the guy slightly. He might not get the full sweep, but he'll turn the guy and then he'll come up to his knees while the guy's uh, trying to stay on balance. Other good stuff on these Bellator cards. Aaron Pico. Um, I feel like I was not super hyped for this fight because it's a, it's a step back in competition again. Um, but I really liked what Pico did here. Uh, he fought basically the style that I am always saying I would love to see someone fight, which is wrestle to the fence, free your hands, hit the body. And he did it beautifully. He sort of cut the cage on this guy, ended with one twos. Uh, as he shot the two, he ducked in head to the t- head to jawline or, or chest to chest and pushed the guy back to the fence. And then he could uh, free one of his hands, normally his left hand, and start left hooking the body. And he was doing terrific hitting with this. If you watch round one and round two, he is beating the shit out of this lad's body. Uh, respect to the other guy for staying in there because he was wilting hard under these uh, these body shots. And th- another thing that I really like about it is that you can get, by wrestling into that position, well, firstly, one of the reasons I love it is because it takes away a lot of the risk. In any striking sport or striking exchange, there is risk of the other guy clipping you. Uh, Pico himself got knocked out off of like loading up on a big left hook really early on in his career. One of the ways you can reduce the risk is to infight, which is, you know, sort of a form of wrestling. Go watch um, Henry Armstrong. Very different era of boxing. They actually allowed him to work with his head pressed up against the guy. But uh, Henry Armstrong or um, Roberto Duran is a more recent example. But people who kept their hands on their opponent's arms and gloves and cut off their op- opportunities to throw while throwing their own punches. But Armstrong was really good because he kept his head on the opponent's chest or collarbone or, or um, neck and just pushed them up out of their stance constantly. And if you can push a guy back to the ropes or the cage, in our case, you can uh, lift them out of their stance. Their stance is what gives them power. If you push someone into the fence and you keep your feet in a stance, you just have to free your hands and you can bang away. And they're in a position where they're not going to be throwing back with much power um, unless you step back like Ryan Bader versus Glover Teixeira, which is a really dumb, dumb, dumb way to get knocked out. Um, but yeah, there's a few good examples of this working in MMA. I don't think I've seen any examples of it being attempted and not really working, but Diaz versus McGregor too, um, Jones versus 
Teixeira. Jones did it against Daniel Cormier as well. And now this one uh, is absolutely fantastic. And he frees his hand. And what he can do is, because he, he's close enough, he can keep his right hand on the guy's neck in a collar tie. And he can hold him and start blasting him. And the rear hand collar tie with the lead hand uppercut or, or hook uh, with the lead hand uppercut is a monster punch. We were talking about this with Betabiev the other day. Um, he throws his right hand over the top of the guy's guard, uh, lets his elbow come down so he's just grabbing behind the head. And then with his left foot right underneath him, he drives off it and uppercuts him in the face. So Pico was hammering with left hooks to the body and left uppercuts, and every time this guy tried to circle out to the right, he'd wind up and swing in a big right hook to the body. He was just pounding him. And then every time they were out in the open, if Pico couldn't move him back to the cage, he'd throw in a calf kick, or when the guy came in on him, he'd duck in and uh, do what's sometimes called like a um, trap hook dump. So it's like a double leg, but instead of grabbing both legs, you have one leg and then your other arm goes up to their trap, and you just bundle them over. There's a really good video on it by Earn Your Gold Medal on... Uh, YouTube, but uh, GSP did it to BJ Penn numerous times. Yeah, just took these easy takedowns. I will say his guard passing was like non-existent and he wasn't striking from the top. So the threat to the other guy of, of opening up, you know, it was there that like, if I open up, I get taken down, but it wasn't as bad as getting pushed to the fence and battered. Whereas if he was opening up on top with elbows and, and trying to pressure and pass the guard and so on, I think you'd have the guy... You know, he'd be going into a spiral, basically, because he, he wouldn't be able to fight his way off the fence, wouldn't be able to threaten Pico back without opening up for the takedown. Um, whereas here, it was like, yeah, I'm getting taken down, but I might as well, so that I don't get pushed to the fence and beaten up. And that was basically the third round. But yeah, real promising stuff from Aaron Pico, because if he can use his wrestling and his power, uh, you know, his powerful boxing, uh, in a way where he cuts off his opponent's opportunities to hit back, I think he's a really dangerous man. And it's so rare to have someone with these boxing and wrestling skills that they can um, they could benefit so much from this synergy. He's a smart man for doing this. Probably listens to my podcast. That's all I'm saying. Elsewhere, Mads Bunnell did good, dominated. the. Uh, he's number six in the world in their division, and he dominated number seven. Um, basically, it was, it was the rest of the guy took him down immediately, and Mads Bunnell just did exactly what you do from half guard. He got the underhook, came up, um, swept him, got on top, didn't get off. Uh, the problem was he kept getting on top and not actually attacking this guy. He'd just get side control and then hold it. Because he was hoping the guy would explode into like a turn to his knees and then Mads Benel is the king of the Japanese necktie. But I feel like he should have been forcing something at some point. Also looking pretty hittable on the feet compared to his usual self. I mean, he's always sort of stood in front of people and covered up. But he tends to do it with like a cross guard or high forearms and move his head a little bit. And uh, this one, he was just sort of like standing there and taking it. Anything else notable? Elima Lay McFarlane got a bad decision win over Kana Watanabe. Um, I'm trying to remember, like, people propped this girl up as an incredible fighter a few years ago, but she had a serious decline. Um, Yancy Medeiros. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, there was a fight cancelled on this card that we were all looking forward to. Kyoji Horiguchi was going to fight Ray Borg. Ray Borg had looked good in his last UFC fight against um, Ricky Simone. He then left the UFC and gone on a 3-0 and um, decision streak. But, uh, yeah, it was like, oh, he's, he's, getting his, he's getting his shit together. He's not missed weight, blah, blah, blah. But he was fighting at bantamweight. And he's missed weight at bantamweight before. They booked him to fight Kyoji Horiguchi at flyweight, which I, I didn't think of at the time. At the time, I was like, oh, that's good. Kyoji's going back to flyweight. That's probably where he belongs because he looked so tiny against Patchy Mix. I didn't think Ray Borg back at flyweight. Hmm, what could go wrong here? But, uh, yeah, he botched it again. Botched the weight cut so badly that they cancelled the fight. His management disowned him, and he retired. I have no idea how this dude... It, I, I like him. I like his fights. I I understand he had some horrible tragedy or uh, difficulties going on with his child, and that, was a, that excused a few of those weight misses. But I don't think there's ever been anyone so unprofessional in MMA. Um, at a certain point, if you're missing the weight, just go up a weight class. If you're missing 135, go up to 145. But he doesn't want to because obviously he'd be tiny there. Um, yeah, just bizarre. I, I, I doubt he's stuffing his face after workouts or anything like that. But it's just crazy that he repeatedly took these fights at weight classes that he provably couldn't make. 
So with that off the card, Yancy Medeiros gets moved up because he's Hawaiian. You know, that's why Alima uh, Elimele is here. Well, I mean, Elimele McFarlane, respect to her because she's the entire reason that Bellator goes to uh, Hawaii. She was their big Hawaiian fighter. She was their champ. They go there now. And it's, it's a fucking fight out of time because it's all uh, fight for the troops era shit. It's all saluting all the time and thank you for your service and we're going to play the national anthem. It's really weird. It's like being in 2004. But Yancy Medeiros, Hawaiian guy, Long-time UFC vet, fun fighter. You know, if you remember his fight against uh, Eve Edwards back in the day, I was like, oh, my God, Yancy Medeiros is going to be something. Because this was before people were even using the front snap kick to the body. And, Yancy, and you know, and I'm going, everyone should be learning to switch hitch. Yancy Medeiros is going both stances, hitting Eve, uh, Eve Edwards with these front kicks to the body, just bending him in half. And I'm like, damn, this dude's going to go far. And then he sort of didn't. <laughs> but... Uh, he always had this thing where he'd like throw these wide ass shots because he's a very long, lanky dude. He'd throw these left hooks like swinging wide out. We'll talk about this with Ryan Gar- Garcia later. Wide swings and get caught down the center. And you know, as Barney Ross used to say, the right straight down the down the inside of the left hook is the most dangerous counterpunch in boxing. And but Medeiros is always getting hit by them. Like if you watch this Dustin Poirier fight, he's constantly getting dropped while swinging wide, and he just crumples like he's made. He's like someone turned on ragdoll physics. But Medeiros has lost a step quite a long time ago. Left the UFC on a 4-0 slump. Um, fought Emmanuel Sanchez in Bellator this time last year. And actually got the decision. But Emmanuel Sanchez is a featherweight and Yancy Medeiros is a former welterweight. Um, they found him, this guy, Charlie Leary, who had a 17-13 and 13 record. And Charlie Leary actually kicked the shit out of him for the first part of this round. <laughs> and then finally Yancy sort of, after... Dropping to a knee about five times and doing looking like a pile of falling laundry. Uh, he managed to get it back in it and, and he knocked Theory down and got the rear naked choke. I mean, it was a fun fight, but it's just they set him up to win and he still oh, came dangerously close to losing. Um, anything else on that card? Samika Inabo beat the shit out of Veta Artegia, Artega, whatever her name is. Um, you know, and, and she's hot and they've been pushing her really hard uh, because she's hot. But it turns out she's also pretty good. So, yeah, that's good. Oh, and then there was a fun one because Tyron Fortune won a fight by DQ. Um, he got dropped by this guy, Sergei Bilostini, tried for a takedown. The guy, basically, he's he's in on the hips along the fence, but just chilling there. And Sergei Bilostini starts throwing the Travis Brown elbows. He lands about 15 of them. And the commentators go, oh, Tyron Fortune just doesn't care. And uh, then he hits him with one more and the guy just crumples onto the mat. And uh, he throws a load of punches and... It's all nearly the back of the head because the back of the head is so nebulous in MMA. But this is the first time in a long time I've seen the ref call it and uh, immediately DQ'd the guy. Very unfortunate for him because he was kicking the shit out of Tyrell Ford. You know, they rank as like the, one of their top 15 heavyweights. So before we jump back to the UFC, there's one other thing I want to say that you should watch, which is Rise. Uh, take note, watch it in a couple of days when they upload it to their YouTube. Big kickboxing organization in Japan. Their most recent one, Rise 167, they had a fight between Naoki Tanaka and um, Ken Nakamura. I previewed this on the pod, uh, on the podcast, but um, man, they had a bomb burner. Ken Nakamura is, is a guy who's he's a southpaw and he go, gets by on being weird. He's too short for his weight class, really, especially because uh, Naoki's tall. And uh, he circles around the ring backwards and then tries to hit you with a left straight or a left overhand or a left high kick, like one at a time. But... Uh, he, ended, he was getting the shit kicked out of him in the first two rounds of this. And then he comes out in round three, I think it was, with a leaping sidekick to the lead leg. Leaping sidekick to the lead leg. Lift the knee up as if to do a leaping sidekick kick to the lead leg and jump in with a high kick with the other leg. The old scissor kick. And he smashed him upside the temple with it. And then the fight was back on. He just, they just tore into each other for the next two rounds. Really good stuff. He won the decision, actually, a majority decision. I thought Tanaka probably should have won it. I watched it without sound, most of it, so I was, uh, he could have not been hitting him that hard, <laughs> but it looked like he was he was touching him up a lot. Uh, Tanaka was, was landing well. He's got a great right hand, really long, gangly guy, too. But yeah, there was an awful lot of both men reaching for a collar tie or just trying to pull into a clinch and not really committing to it and then getting banged with punches on the other end. And then the co-main event, I mean, so, so firstly, watch that fight because it's an absolute barn burner. Uh, it's five rounds, but, you know, it's kickboxing, so they're three-minute rounds. It's 15 minutes of your life. You'll love it. And then Kazuki Osaki, who I'm rapidly coming around to. Really fun guy. Stays on offense. He's got a guard that's like the, the Nick Diaz, uh, Nate Diaz 
put them up guard, the one that they do theatrically. But that weird old school boxing guard where your wrists and hands face you. And I've heard people like there was a there was someone theorizing that that was from when U.S. Marines took boxing to the Philippines and because of knife fighting, they keep their uh, wrists inwards. And I was like, that sounds stupid. But, you know, the old school, old, old school pugilistic guard is both hands out, but wrists pointing inwards. But yes, he fights out of a, of a high shell guard with his, with his uh, forearms and elbows quite high. But what he does is he, he's, what makes him different to someone like Robin Van Roosmalen, who I'm always moaning about his style, um, even though he's retired, I can't stop kicking him while he's down. Um, but, his style was to cover up, take punches on his guard, and then come back with combinations and low kicks. And it was a style that just fell apart if you didn't have giant gloves to hide behind. We got into this with Muay Thai and, and four rounds Muay Thai, but like if you're if you're blocking something near where it starts, so if you're putting your hands over the guy's shoulders, you're putting the web of your hand into their bicep, um, you're you know you're smothering them, you're smothering their punches. The further back you can block the punch, the better. The closer to the target that you block the punch, so like you putting up a guard, the more of it you absorb. And Robin Van Roos, Van Roosmalen just hid behind his gloves the entire time. Um, what Kazuki Osaki does that I really like is that he covers up and he gets on offense. He doesn't wait and then return with a big freak out. You know that was Van Roosmalen. He he wait cover up. And then as soon as you were done punching, he threw his back. He, if you throw a three-punch combination, he threw a four-punch combination and a low kick. And he just got, got ahead of you over time. What Osaki was doing was cutting this guy off with dipping jabs, cutting him off with short low kicks. He wasn't turning his hip over. Like the guy would low kick him, throw the right low kick at him, and he'd point his foot out into the low kick and kick at the same time and chop the guy's leg. It was really impressive. So he's using these short techniques right in front of the guy to steal the in. Uh, the initiative and get to work on combinations because what he's known for is body punching combinations and um, just overwhelming people but he gets there by any time that they look like they're going to get on the on the front foot and take the initiative he goes no not your turn yet i'm talking his dipping jab or his right low kick uh, are, are the equivalent of putting your finger on someone's lips when they start trying to explain something to you but they had three good rounds and then in the fourth round uh, nicholas rivers throws a spinning back kick at him, and uh, Osaki steps back, lets it fall short, and then goes, fuck it, why not? Which is the moment... I mean, Bass Rutten was talking about how he, he game-planned with Dwayne Ludwig for this. There was a guy he fought who uh, in K1 who loved to wheel kick. So he said, Dwayne, go out there and throw the wheel kick and then counter the wheel kick because it will come back at you immediately. And, uh, and he did, because as soon as you do a spinny kick at someone or a cartwheel kick... How many times have you seen this in the UFC? Someone does a fucking cartwheel kick and the other guy has to do it back immediately. Um, or a flying knee. And uh, Osaki just goes, oh, fuck it, throws a, a spinning back kick back at him. Not a wheel kick, not round, straight to the head, and he knocks him out. Unbelievable knockout. Watch the fight for technical excellence and, and body punching from uh, Osaki, and, you know, game work from Rivers, um, but then watch the knockout because he's just banging. It's on Twitter. You can go see the knockout for free. I mean, you can watch the whole thing for free. They'll upload it to their... Uh, YouTube page in a couple of days. So go subscribe to the um, and turn on alerts. To I, I never even tell people to do that for this podcast. Turn on alerts if you're listening to this on uh, YouTube. But go subscribe to Rise Kickboxing and turn on alerts. And any time that they upload their fights, go have a look. But before this fight, they did put out a hype package. Uh, sorry, before this event, they put out a hype package where Naoki, the champion, was dressed as the Joker. I was like, never ever agree to dress as the Joker for any hype footage ever. He did the tilted head thing. It's, it's so cringe. And it, it, it didn't even, a, it, like a day later, it was cringe. It's not like one of those things where you're going to look back in 10 years and go, oh, that was a bit cringe. It's cringe right now. Marcus Perez still does this before every fight and everyone just goes, oh, that was awkward. Douche chill. So rest of the UFC card before I bugger off, because I've, if you can't tell, I'm completely losing my voice. Uh, Bruno Silva knocked out Brad Tavares. I thought this was quite good. Brad Tavares was using double jabs quite well uh, and then got caught with a, a hook over the jab, reaching, uh, and knocked out. Bobby Green leapt headfirst into Jared Gordon. I don't know what he was trying to do. I mean, there was, there was a fist out there. But the fist didn't have anything behind it. Bobby Green was throwing his head forward. Which is dope. I'm a huge fan of headbutting people, particularly if you get away with it. But if you don't, you know, you're letting the side down. 
So no contest with Jared Gordon. Um, Jeremiah Wells versus Matthew Semmelsberger was one of the weirdest fights I've watched recently. This was, someone described it as a uh, a fight that could have been 30-27 in either direction. They'd have been fine with it. Because Semmelsberger rocked this guy's shit at the start of every round. He came in with a big overhand and chinned him. Jeremiah Wells couldn't avoid it. <laughs> but then Jeremiah Wells would take him down and ride out the whole round on top because Semmelsberger didn't really have any means of getting up. Which, when you look at it that way, I was going, yeah, well, I, yeah, I can understand how they scored it for Wells. But then you think, and this was something else someone said on the Reddit thread, which I was, it really did make me think, if Semmelsberger, had, if the rounds had been the same, but Semmelsberger had chinned him at the end, they'd probably have given Semmelsberger those rounds. Which, I mean, just, you know, it, it's a uh, hammer's home, everything we already say about stealing rounds. You can do it because these, you know, it's judges. They're people, they're fallible. I mean, they're especially fallible, but uh, they are easy to distract with whatever's just happened, especially if, if nothing's really happened in the round and then something big does. Christos Yagas knocked out Ricky Glenn. Man, Ricky Glenn has been so bad since he lost the moustache, but he was just sort of reaching for him. It was really weird. Throwing, pushing out his hands like uh, uh, Guillermo Rigon, Rigondo used to do. But Rigondo would be loading up a counterpunch. He'd be putting his hands out there just to, to like confuse you. And then when he threw back, he'd hit you. Whereas Ricky Glenn's just putting his hands out there and then gets chinned. Really weird. Oh, Rani Aya lost to Montel Jackson, basically the way we all said it would. Uh, you know, I was, I was previewing this on the boycast and going, oh, this is a hard one because Montel Jackson is sneaky good. And Rani Aya, you know, Montel Jackson, he has the high, second highest successful takedown rate in the UFC. I don't think he's going to have trouble stopping Rani Aya's shot. And uh, yeah, that's exactly what you saw. He had no trouble at all. And then he knocked him out because Rani Aya was throwing this weird inside. He was throwing this inside low kick to jab at the same time. It was exactly what Ranger Stott did. If you've never seen Ranger Stott, YouTube now, Ranger Stott, Mark Kerr. This was the days when just random weirdos with uh, Wing Chun backgrounds who claimed to have 300 street fights would fight in the UFC tournament, but they'd also have Mark Kerr. And Mark Kerr ends up against this guy who's just no business being in the same ring as him, and he kills him. But Ranger Stott comes out throwing these inside low kick to jab, exactly like Rani Aya from a mile out. And then Kerr just grabs him and knees him in the head. <laughs> like it's it's a rare Mark Kerr standing knockout. Oh, maybe we should do a, a group watch along of the the Smashing Machine or something because that was such a good film. Norma Dumont and Carla, Carol Rosa had a title eliminator, but it was just awful. Nothing happened. And then Mohammed Usman versus Julia Taffer. I'm I'm going to read this comment from the Reddit thread because it made me laugh so much. So this is by Fam Jordan. He said. Usman moves like a giant muscular baby. Sorry. Like a giant muscular baby with an extremely full diaper. Oh, I keep saying it, but Mohammed Usman is just a spitting in the face of USADA. But also, if you're Kamaru, and people are already suspicious that you might be using EPO anyway, um, why? And, and your dad is a disgraced pharmacist who went to prison. Why are you letting your brother fight? Just pay him not to. Just pay him not to draw attention to you. And that was about it for that card. It wasn't anything special. Um, everything interesting happened not in the UFC this week. But yeah, we've got a great main event coming up next week. Um, and I think I'll talk about Ryan Garcia versus Javante Davis on the boycast. Lots to explore, particularly that wide left hook we were talking about. Uh, I was just watching Harold Graham talk about the left hook, and he had some interesting thoughts. If you want to get in on the boycast and anything that I write in the meantime, sign up to the Patreon. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jacksackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing anytime, fightprimer.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack. Big John McCarthy podcasting over Danny Sabatello's only career finish, bless.